So, uh, <coughs> first thing I, I was not aware of how to start in English, so I made my best to translate to English every night. Uh, you will find maybe a couple of English times. I will find my first time to go to the want to go and go one of the night. So, yeah, I will I make my capacity to translate slides. So, uh, here's what I want to show you. Okay. So first I will just make some uh, talk about stuff, you know, stuff in the map, apply the code. Then uh, a very brief introduction to the physics of the line in the map, on the para animal parameters, the kind of experience you can run. Uh, I will briefly go through what we call reference time and structure calculation. And then uh, I hope to get down here if uh, too long, uh, I will step here and go back because I think this is after after talking with some people yesterday. I think this is what probably uh, more people will be interested in. Well, so to start, what, what what can we learn from protein or biomolecular and in general? Uh, well, with the, the, the experience goes like this: we you, you get the sample. Way the tube you put in the animal spectrometer. The animal spectrometer will give you spectra which look more or less like this. You get information from this spectra. You change your sample, add the sample, or something else, and get back in spectrum and the, the cycle goes on and on. And in the end, you get the, you can get quite a lot of information out of, of, of the change of your sample or your signal, right? What kind of information? Well, in first place, uh, animal is well known because it's one of the two main techniques for structure calculation. Uh, and you can do structure calculation by animal, but uh, as Felipe was saying yesterday, it's not the best thing to do, right? So if I, I am an animal spectroscopist, and I tell you, maybe I shouldn't be taking this, if you have the system is open and you can whatever where you want to get structure. Right? Try to give it, you don't get that thing because no, it's not the 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 left thing in the map, right? Uh, and the is much better at characterizing dynamics or something. Probably the uh, my opinion is that the technique where you get uh, uh, more detail and in a long in a wider time range uh, dynamic information. Yes. Dynamic information from nanoscale kind of scales to scale kind of scales. You can take this all which is in large time scale range where relevant to the mistake place. One thing that animal is very good at and no other thing is good at is uh, working on unstructured process. You know, uh, in the last decade, uh, with the, the presence of uh, Functional structure process in organism was recognized and uh, there was quite a boom. You will hear about unstructured biology somewhere, and in the mind, the, the technique which is best suited to give structural information and structure process. Uh, it's the only technique where you get uh, atomic detailed information on the behavior of uh, unstructured proteins. You can quickly even without knowing exactly what's going on, you can quickly understand the structural alteration of proteins. So you can see, for instance, without knowing much, a speaker of spectra will tell you if a protein is, for instance, partially stabilized, is homogeneous or heterogeneous, and all this is well for it. And it's also one of the techniques of choice when you want to characterize protein and interaction. Uh, all ligands or like protein protein or protein acid interaction, you will get basic uh, statistical information and uh, you also can calculate the position and so on and so on. And so on. Uh, it's widely used in drug design because you can see not only the protein or, or the target uh, that you can uh, want to work on, but you can also see the ligands and determine whether, <coughs> for instance, the ligands are close together when bound <coughs> to an active site or not, 
And uh, in this way, uh, act rationally to improve uh, your, your, your compound or your leaf. Uh, this is also something which is uh, re relatively new. It, well, it started with this second paper in 2001. Uh, we can see from the itself, right? So, you, if, you, if you get to work in spectral biology, you will, you will all usually find what, what the physiological relevance of what you are getting. And, well, here I can tell you I, I, I am giving a physiological relevance information because I can see no detection or whatever inside the cell. What goes on with this with the system inside the cell? Well, you can work <coughs> in bacteria. Initially, what uh, work was on in bacteria, but uh, you can work in other sites. And more recently, uh, people developed techniques to work in uh, cell culture. So you can see the structure of the proteins inside the cell and uh, how how it evolves depending on the uh, element. is also the only technique by which you can have an accurate calculation of uh, protein cell, excited states. By excited states, I mean, you know, uh, you can think of the protein energy like something relatively rough. So, we, we usually work on, uh, we tend to work on the, I told you yesterday that uh, NMR is small. I, I, I do not agree with that. I, I can tell you that you can work with the biggest system. This is the biggest system that uh, was ever tackled by NMR, the 20th protein system. system. And it's quite large, okay? It's 630 kilograms. It's not easy to work with, right? But, uh, it's quite Fancy labeling techniques, but uh, as long as you have the money and the idea, uh, you can do whatever you want in terms of system size. So, well, uh, I will start with the uh, what's an MR to start with. So, it's nuclear magnetic and resonance, okay? Uh, very briefly, nuclear magnetic, we work on uh, the state of nuclear steel. Uh, you can think of the nucleus as a small sphere running around, and uh, the, this angular momentum is quantized. Associated to the angular momentum, you have a, it, it, uh, you can have a magnetic moment. If you can think of the nucleus as a moving charge, so it will give uh, you a magnetic moment, and the magnetic moment is. Uh, Related to the angular momentum by this constant, which is called the uh, diamagnetic equation. In uh, protein NMR, you can have many, many different uh, uh, quantum number, but we work we work only on uh, in one half UTI. So in in one half UTI, you have only two states. You have the up state and the down state, if you wish. Uh, we call them alpha and beta. Okay. So in principle, these two states are regenerate, but when you put your sample in the magnetic field, they, they are not very common regenerate, they have two different energies, and what we measure in NMR is transitions between uh, these two levels, which uh, 
have a energy difference depending on the magnetic field applied. Why? So that's magnetic energy field. Why resonance? This comes from the early days of NMR when, when you would do an experiment by scanning energy, right? The, the same way you go to get the energy spectrum on the other spectrum. It was done by scanning energy, so you, you have the, the six magnetic fields, you would uh, scan the, the, the energy to the, well, this was magnetic field fixed uh, radiation, but in any case, at some point you would get absorption and or, or resonance, and that's why we, we, we talk about neutral uh, magnetic resonance. Experience and not done in this way any longer, I will tell you what, what they do. Well, I will tell you in a few minutes how we do things now. So, one big problem about NMR is the, the energy. We, we have two levels, and you know that uh, to decide transition, two levels have to apply energy uh, that matches the, the difference between the two uh, energy levels. And in NMR, the energy is very small. It's in the order of the, uh, it's in the megahertz range, right? It's 10 to the 6 hertz, compared with the uh, light that is in the order of 10 to the 11 hertz, or something like that, with 5 orders of magnitude below light, and it's way less energetic. And the, the problem with this is we can generate this kind of energy, the problem. But the problem with this is that uh, the difference in population depends on different energy, right? And the probability of watching the transition, that's what we want to do, depends on the population. So if you have, say, the molecules below and no molecules in the, the upper level, every time you, you get the force of there, you get the transition. That's what happens in for the UV, for the kind of high energy and microscopy. In NMR, if you have 1 million molecules in the lower cell, you have 1 million and 64 molecules in the upper cell. So you have a very little possibility of getting it, right? And that means that the signal we get that is proportional to the population difference is very small. So the main issue with the NMR is that it's a very interesting uh, That we can compensate by, uh, that we, what we do is compensate for that by adding, adding as many experiments uh, than even that. The sensitivity is defined by the field and the diagrammatic ratio of, uh, of the nucleus that we're watching. Uh, the larger the field, the higher the sensitivity. We get one half stronger magnitude, we get more signal. And uh, the higher the uh, gamma, and I will tell you about this in a few slides, uh, the more uh, sensitive the natural rule. Now, uh, I wish up a start. What nuclei we see in Bio-NMR. In proteins, we have uh, these elements globally: carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, and phosphorus. And all of these have different isotopes, natural isotopes components. Right? So, protons you have most. Uh, hydrogen you have most of them are protons. 99.98 percent of hydrogen is proton. 0.016 is deuterium. In carbon, you have most of it as carbon-12, and a bit of it, 1% about uh, uh, of all the carbons are carbon-13. Nitrogen, you have most as nitrogen-14, and a bit like as nitrogen-15. Uh, phosphorus, you have all of it as phosphorus-31. But uh, I told you a couple of slides before that we want to work on spin one half UPI. And it turns out that uh, we don't have a nice correspondence. Yeah, we have only spin one half UTI with uh, high natural abundance 
for proton and for phosphorus, uh, for carbon and nitrogen we have nothing. We are not that lucky. And for oxygen we have no no nucleus, no isotope with uh, one half the speed. So what oxygen you 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 there basically don't so uh, only proton and phosphorus 31 have high natural abundance. We can work with carbon 13 and nitrogen 16, and we have to calculate that the only way we we have to get uh, enough spread in your signal. Uh, you can work with this, but you need isotope enrichment, and this is uh, a bit the, the bottleneck in the mass study, the possibility of doing uh, isotope enrichment. Now I will go back here, and I will tell you that uh, each of the nuclei, each of the nuclei, uh, will resonate at different frequencies. Why? Because each nucleus has a different gamma, a different magnetic ratio. So if you put, you, you get your your uh, standard magnet, say a magnet that, that is 40.1 tesla, is one of the standard magnets we use. Protons will resonate as 100 MHz, carbon will resonate at 150 MHz, and nitrogen will resonate at 60 MHz. So, uh, you see that the spread in resonance frequency is very large, that means that we cannot detect all of them simultaneously. It's not that we should go to a whole new range to the spectrum and see what it goes to fire me. That's way too large to detect all together. But, uh, this can be seen, uh, can be seen as, uh, as a problem, but it can be seen as an advantage because we can work with them separately. So we can see protons on one spectrum, carbon on another spectrum, and nitrogen on another spectrum, and see the interaction between them, and then help us to get information. And I don't want to forget this important thing. Uh, in NMR, we we don't measure the size of our language uh, in the natural magnetic unit that are uh, Gauss or Tesla, but we talk about, uh, we, we define the, the magnet strength by the frequency at which protons press. So you will hear that this group or this laboratory has a 400 meters, 600 meters, 600 meters, 600 meters, whatever. Okay, so this is what I want you to know about the basic of the NMR, right? We measure speed transitions, the difference in energy, the, the differences in energy are low, that means we have low signal to noise, but we can measure with uh, high precision. And in proteins, we, we work with T1 half nuclei, uh, proton, which is naturally abundant, and carbon nitrogen, which need isotopic with. And each of them resonates at a particular frequency depending on the carbonic rate. Now, I will spend five or six slides uh, telling you about the, the hardware. Okay? How we measure animal spectrum. Well, this is a, a, a very nice definition I, I read in an outlook. Animal machine is basically a big and expensive electric radio. Why, why is it uh, an electric radio? Because, uh, as I show you here, Nuclear resonate is the orbit of the megahertz. If you know the broadcast also in the order of megahertz, so that the equipment you use to detect your signal, to, to, to style your, your, your samples, are basically the same kind of equipment you need for FM broadcast. The signal generation and amplifier with the which work in the uh, megahertz. The other thing you need is, of course, uh, a magnet. Okay? You need a magnet, you need an FM radio, antenna, coils, which will be around the, the sample, and of course, something to record uh, the uh, With skip this, what we need is, again, a magnet. What kind of magnet? We use superconducting magnet. I will tell you a little bit in uh, the next slide uh, about this. Uh, we need a probe where the, the, the antenna that is ready to be located. The probe is something which looks like this and is inserted inside the magnet. And we need uh, the frequency generator and amplifiers, which are usually packed in something we call uh, 
we call it the console. Uh, well, when we need stopper contacting magnets, because we want to have a large magnetic field, I told you that the larger the magnetic field, the bigger signal to get, and the higher the resolution, we'll, we'll see that a bit later. But we also want to have a stable P0. Why is that? Because if you have a very small variation zero as we will be measuring uh resonance in the high accuracy even far per vision variation in the in the magnitude of this zero will be a problem in your case. So we really want to have something stable and that's why we use supercontactive magnets. Uh, how are they, they build? Well, when, when you see a remote spectrometer, what you... They look like a big uh, water tank. And uh, what you have inside is two work, two work tasks. One outside which is filled with liquid nitrogen, and one inside which is filled with liquid helium. And inside the liquid helium work, you have the, the coil. And uh, the magnet is starting when you buy the spectrometer. The guy who comes to start with uh, helium and nitrogen, and uh, then it will drag it the carbon, about one of the carbon, and then he goes to the loop, and it goes on forever. So it's upper conducting, it never stops, you don't have to do anything. All you have to do is to not forget to fill up the private energy with the okay? Um, the biggest one so far, so I, I told you, you, you have, we worked on the, the hundreds of megahertz range. Uh, the one we have in Rosario is this one, this is 600 megahertz spectrometer. The biggest one that was ever built is uh, 1 gigahertz and a 1000 megahertz uh, spectrometer. It was uh, installed in Lyon, France, and it costed 11.7 million euros, quite uh, a lot of money. The, the, the cost of an enhanced spectrometer is not linear with uh, our 600 spectrometer uh, we, we bought it for about $5,000 uh, 10 years ago. And you see, we go from 600 to 1,000, like a 24. Right, uh, but it has like a exponential in terms of cost. So it, it's much, it's much more expensive to hire this spectrometer because of technical reasons with the superconducting coil. So the question is, who wants, who would like to spend several million euros in the, in the machine? People buy spectrometers; they, they, they have to be used to it. Huh. And the main reason is that uh, when you do an enhanced spectroscopy, you get you get <coughs> a probe in your sample, but it's you, right. So <coughs> you will have information on what happens in your sample for every little sphere here. These are, these are the, the proton, nitrogen, and carbon nuclei of a small probe. You don't need to label them. It's not like when you do the labeling or or stuff like that, and you get very precise information on the behavior of every single position within the within the probe. Okay? And the information you get is related to the spectral parameters that you can mention for each nucleus. Each nucleus will be defined by uh, these parameters that I will explain you now. The chemical shift, couplings, and uh, realization times, and uh, still spin interaction. Uh, well, so how does an animal spectrum look like? I told you that you can get information of, on every nucleus, so you can see uh, every nucleus defined in an animal spectrum. This is actually the case. This is the spectrum of the small molecules, strictly. For some other reason, this is some kind of standard that we use in NMR. I, I don't know really why, but it is a very 
beautiful spectrum in protons, right? So you see here, <coughs> you have uh, a number for each proton in the molecule and uh, a corresponding line in the spectrum. You can separate every single proton. That, that's the great power of that. You can see what happens to every single nucleus. Uh, but when we go to proteins, of course, things become more complicated. It's the spectrum of lines assigned at 900 megahertz. Here we have 959 spectrum uh, protons compared to 29 here, right? And you can see that uh, it is way more crowded. The problem here is how to get the information from these protons. So probably in this line you have, I don't know, 5, 6, 10 protons. How you get information on that? Oh, well, I will address that a little bit later. The first thing I will tell you is uh, why the protons represent a different frequency. And the reason is that nuclei uh, is rather surrounded by electrons, by electron clouds, and electrons produce small magnetic fields that oppose the zero. That, that can be uh, sort of as a screen. Right? So the, the, the effective field is the nucleus and the actual field uh, that you apply. Uh, what this means is that uh, the effective field in the nucleus will be smaller than the, the total field, every single nucleus will resonate at different frequencies. The difference in energy between the two levels will be uh, smaller here, what, where the nucleus is more shielded, than here, the where the nucleus is less shielded. That means that, for instance, in ethanol, we'll get a signal for the methyls, a signal for the methylene, and a signal for the OH program. Right? You have, this is less shielded, this is, this is more shielded, sorry, less shielded, less shielded. And, uh, this shielding depends on the chemical environment of, uh, of the the shielding has a field dependence, it's not constant. And uh, the, the, this shielding is proportional to V0, and the frequency is also proportional to V0. So we express this shielding in terms of something we call <coughs> chemical shield. And Jorge will, if I hope, more detail this, I won't spend more time. <coughs> the important thing to remember here is that this chemical shield, what we call delta, is independent of the, the, the external field. So, uh, this kind of spectra will look the same in the, in the scale independently of uh, where you, you got the same. They will look the same in a 900, 400, in a gigahertz spectrometer. What is the, the Chemical what are the chemical shifts of protons in proteins? Well, they span a relatively narrow range from 0 to 10 ppm. Uh, I, I remind you they are part of the beam. And you will, you will find at the left and oh, right, right end, right uh, end, at the right end you will have the, the metal signals. Here you, you will have all the aliphatic protons, that, that is the more crowded vision. Uh, H alpha will be between 3 and 6 ppm. Uh, you will find around 7 ppm the aromatic side chains, the back on H chains, uh, which are really important and we'll go back later, are between 6 and 10 ppm. And you will find the drip of an indole uh, around 10 ppm. They are quite well, uh, quite well separated. Uh, when we go to carbon, the spread is much higher. You see here, we go from 0 to 180. Yes, that means that the difference is much higher for carbon and for proton. You go from 0 to 10. That would be like this. So all the proton spectrum would be condensed in this small range. And you got, uh, and, and carbons are really well separated in such a way that uh, we can work with them as if they were different. So, aliphatic carbon are essentially different. Yeah. Uh, different. You can work with it separately in spectra. You can separate 
spectroscopically alpha carbon from aromatic carbon and carbonic carbon. So that, that's the, 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 the characteristic of the tube tube. Right, so you have the frequency of 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 the frequency we have named up two kinds of interactions, one which we call scalar interactions, which are two bond interactions, right? <coughs> that means that these interactions will uh, depend on two nuclei be close, closer than and bond from one another. Right? So two bonds, one bond, two bonds, four bonds. Uh, this kind of interaction will give us information about bond connection and by The other uh, interaction that we have is the interaction, which holds two space. That means two nuclear that are close together, two space, they interact with each other, they influence the other energy because they are close together. And these equal interactions will give us information about distance and uh, relative orientation. So what's scalar coupling? This I will go very quick. Uh, it's the influence one nucleus have on another because it happens on that, right? So you here you see a diagram of what happens. Imagine that you have a non-coupled non nucleus with this energy difference. If it is bound to a closed proton, carbon or whatever, the energy of the blue nucleus will depend on whether the yellow nucleus is up or down, right? So if the yellow nucleus goes against the blue, the energy gap which is the subject of the blue nucleus will be smaller and if it goes with the field, the energy gap will be larger. That means that you would see instead of one single transition, you would see two transitions, and this indicates that thing A is coupled to B. Right. This uh, scalar coupling uh, is uh, constant in health and in the separation in time. What's more important is scalar coupling can transmit information to different groups and different they give information also uh, about dihedral uh, angle, and here we got this guy who was the Nobel Prize again. Carl uh, Brooks, I think, he was the Nobel Prize for six more interesting than this equation, but uh, it's rather simple. Uh, but, well, we also divide this. Uh, this is an empirical equation which relates the coupling with the dihedral angle, the coupling between piscina protons with the dihedral angle that the system forms. You, you have proton, carbon, carbon, proton. The dihedral angle will have its dependence, and the, the coupling will have its dependence on, uh, on angle. And in protest, uh, there's one dihedral angle which is quite interesting to measure, which is the phi angle in the backbone, and it's well defined by the coupling between the NH proton and the alpha proton. This coupling goes nicely with, uh, with the angle. The other kind of coupling we have is the dipolar coupling. This is a direct interaction through space. It's like two magnets with each other. And uh, it will depend on the angle between the distance, the vector that defines the distance between the two nuclei and the uh, applied magnetic field. It has this dependence on the applied magnetic field, on the, on the angle and the distance with the nuclei. And uh, it can be very large, very large. So you see here, for a pair of protons which are 10 grams from the weight, it's relatively large. 
The dipolar coupling can be, it will be about 120 kilograms. They are both aligned. If you compare that with this case, go here from 0 to 10 cells, it's 10 to the 4 times larger. A, a very strong interaction. Point is that in solution, this angular dependence, big uh, cosine square theta minus 1, average is 0. So we won't see an effective right solution. Well, molecules are standing in the and they explore all possible orientations with respect to the magnetic field. You won't see a direct report of dipolar interaction. You won't see scaling, as you would see in scalar coupling, but it gives the largest contribution to relaxation. And in this way, it gives rise to the nuclear over Hartzell effect, which is the way we have in NMR to measure this. So, to summarize this second part, uh, the big strength of NMR is that we have, for each nuclei, for each nucleus, we have one signal, and that means we have a probe for uh, the environment of what's going on around this nucleus. <coughs> we measure this, the, the, the resonance, the, the resonance position of which is used by its chemical sheet, that will depend on chemical and structural environment. We have interaction between nuclei through bond and through space, scalar and dipolar interaction. And in the spectrum, what I see are signals from each nucleus at different chemical shifts and coupling between nuclei. So we see splitting and correlation when we have scalar, scalar decoupling nuclei, and we will see what well, difference in language and in a week when two nuclei are dipolar decoupling. So, so far, so good. I, I, this is very quick and very lazy, but I, I want, I want to, you to know this, to start with what is relevant. So, how do we obtain spectra? So this nice, many signal spectra that I showed you before. It was originally done, originally done by frequency state. Again, trying to find out where nuclear resonate and detection of absorption. But <coughs> quite a long time ago, uh, in the late 60s, early 70s, uh, FT and MR was developed. And what we do nowadays is <coughs> to apply uh, radio frequency pulses that excite all in the other So instead of going frequency on frequency and seeing, well, there's a nuclear here, no, there's only here, yes. Know, in the end of the spectrum, we shall apply a very intense radio frequency pulse that will excite the and then we will detect how this nuclei uh, respond to this excitation. They will relax, they will go back to equilibrium and give us the frequency that frequencies in doing so, right? So when we take the sample response, uh, we will see that the, 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 the nuclei going back to the region, the current in my, in my probe, and uh, we call this response the pre-induction decay, the high decay. And it looks roughly like that. You will see an oscillating curve. The frequency of this oscillation is the frequency of the nuclear going back to, uh, to equilibrium, okay? So we obtain the spectrum via Fourier transform of the time signal. So if you remember yesterday, uh, we had a little bit about Fourier transform, okay? Uh, and I will show you a little bit more about Fourier transform. Real fit. So here it will be a, like a very beautiful FID. You have a single frequency because down, up and down, up and down. <coughs> but real FID is tend to be quite high. So if you have a sing single signal, you will see a single frequency here going up and down, 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 down. If you have two signals, maybe you can figure out here easily what are the two frequencies. When you have many signals, this is most of the time the case, FIDs are really ugly. You cannot tell what the frequency is. The frequencies contained in here are, right? But you have this FID gives rise to this spectrum. Okay, you, you cannot tell anything from here, but from here you can And how does FP, that does this magic work? 
Uh, I have a, a different way of... Uh, <coughs> actually, free transforms are, are very simple. Okay? The formula for a free transform is this one. So the, the spectrum in frequency units will be this integral of the signal in time units, where you sum up all the data points of the signal times the cosine of, the, of this frequency, right? So we can think of FT as a continuous search for a right signal. What happens with this integral? If you have, say, this FID, and you multiply this FID times a frequency which is not the correct one, the product of all of these will have both positive and negative uh, components. Right? When you add up all of these components to infinity, when you have positive and negative, the, the area, the, the total area, this integral will be zero if you go all the way down. The same if you have, if you, if you are not really well. If you are closer, the area will be small, not zero, but smaller, because you again have negative and positive load, right? The only point where you will get a completely positive product will be the frequency that you are probing with much exactly the, uh, the frequency of your signal, right? So, the, the it is really simple. You, you are like probing all the signals, you, you get and well, this is the, the way the numerical the classification of the platform. Probing every, every single frequency in your spectrum and seeing whether it's, it's there or it's not. Now, probing spectra are quite complex, as I showed you before, this is, uh, I, I like to show this one, this is the first NMR spectrum that was recorded on, on the protein, uh, at 40 MHz it was, was done in the 50s, with the first uh, high resolution master meters, and uh, you can see that globally they look the same, this is a spectrum acquired with a modern spectrometer, you see here aliphatic protons, Alpha protons, alpha protons, and we have everything here. But people here wouldn't tell much more than this. And if you get only this spectrum, you cannot, you cannot tell much more than this either. You cannot say much. There's just plenty of signals, but you know that there's information here. Because I told you, there is actually information, information. How, how we get the information from there? Well, the first thing we have to do is separate the two. We cannot work with this bunch of signals together. And so that we rely on transfer of information between the like, and the correlation between the we, In this way, we can separate the signal. And once you separate the signal, you want to know who's who, right? So we have a signal here, for instance, this, this one. For instance, you don't need to separate this. The metal proton is very nicely isolated. So you know who this guy is, you can identify that, right? But how do you know in this case you have to go through the process of attacking, saying who to this case, right? So first thing uh, we do is to separate signals and for that we we acquire 2D, 3D, 4D, and n-dimensional spectrum. And for that we have pulse sequences designed to detect different correlations. Okay? The idea of uh, n-dimensional spectrum is that instead of just Exciting all the things together and what you have the information they give us. Uh, you excite them, you wait for a little while, you do something else, you excite them again or something like that, and you go for another, you, you acquire your signal only then. So, this second time would be equivalent to this FID acquisition, right? And actually, acquiring FID is just sampling 
even if you had some overlap in your Buddhist spectra, here for instance, it's a very beautiful spectrum, but for instance, here there is some overlap. Here you have some overlap. You cannot really tell if you have two, three, four, three. You can go to higher dimension, six dimension, four dimension, ten dimension. Okay, you can go, you can read the things as far as you want. Uh, the only problem is time. For instance, to acquire a, one experiment, to, it takes maybe five, ten seconds. To acquire a two spectrum, you have to repeat this one experiment several times. If you want to do it 256 times, this will take about 20 minutes. For a 3D spectrum, you have to repeat the 2D spectra several times, and this might take a few hours, 3, 4, 10 hours. For a 4D spectrum, you have to repeat several 3D spectra, and 4D spectra take days. Take your sample is a kilometer, and you start the 4D spectra, the 4D spectrum, and you go the week after, and the and the and the and the okay. Uh, higher dimensions are impracticable actually in, in direct acquisition, but uh, there's a trick which is to do projection for n dimensional scale. And uh, this kind of many, many dimensional spectrum, spectral grade because you have absolutely no overlap. You can separate uh, resonance by the frequency of five different nuclei that. It's very important to have overlap. Eventually, be able to separate uh, every single thing. Right? Again? <coughs> you have a quiet spectrum, which is overlapping, so I go further, which is overlapping, go further, and you, you cannot know what you are. And there are things as well, you cannot get rid of overlap. But the process you usually can eventually get no overlap at all. So multidimensional STNMR is a great thing, and it, uh, there was a Nobel Prize awarded because of this to Richard M. from the ETH in 1991. He developed multidimensional STNMR. So, to summarize the third part, uh, for acquiring MR spectra, we uh, acquire time domain data and then we transform. And in protein spectra, we have way too many signals. And I have half an hour, right? Thank you. Have another one. Yeah, but then we say, I don't know, whatever. Oh, yes. you, you, you prefer, no, I, no, I can just go on now, or? Uh, you, you are the type. No, no, You want to go on, or? Okay, go on. Uh, so, in protein spectra, we have way too many signals, and we separate them in n dimensions, and we can correlate the on another label nuclei to get information. So, the first thing we have to do, <coughs> now, I will go to more real life examples. What can I do when, when I have a new sample? Well, when I have, you have a new sample, the first thing you go, you put your sample in the chromita and you acquire a proton one this right? Proton are always there, so you don't need to label with fancy things, you get the same sample you know, you know, you have to you can acquire a proton one the proton spectrum will you immediately tell you, will you, will tell you immediately about the quality and state of your sample. So uh, here you have a spectrum of the same protein in a folded state and a folded state. What's the difference between the two spectrum? I'm not confused. Are they the same? No. So what's the difference? What, how would you describe their difference? Between 9 and 8, you have no signals, right? Between, say, 5 and 6, you have no signals. Below 1, you have no signals. In the unfolded state. This is because an unfolded protein, in an unfolded protein, every single residue is the same. 
I forget sorry, confirmation. And the chemical shift, that's the only thing we are measuring here, the chemical shift of every cross of the sample, you know, it depends basically on whether it's a value, a beauty, or an analogy. So all values will remain all at the same place, all values will remain all at the same place. But the folded protein is not a number of cases, because you have a perinani close to a methyl of the beauty. This methyl proton will go far away, and this is probably why you see a methyl proton here. Every single residue in the back box will this participating, and uh, that's what we, we we get this nice spread of signals. And this is a real case study. This is what we get when we try to collaborate. So you go to someone comes and says, "Well, I have to what do you want from that? Well, protein, right? Protein is buffer. And please avoid protonated buffer. Yeah, yeah, okay, great. So they come with your sample and you immediately say, you can immediately see that they forgot to get rid of this. This signal, this is scaled in a way that this signal goes over the roof. And, uh, well, this, this vision here is tiny because usually you will get less volume than the last one. The one I want to have is my room. That, that affects the water separation. That's the mirror of here. This is the continuous But below of all of these artifacts, we have protein. Right? And the protein looks relatively nice. These are well spread signals, I mean this is a tractive protein, and you have uh, signals below 1 ppm, that is the protein structure. And this is a, a protein which uh, has a, a protein group, uh, a baby, and you can see the signal from the protein group well the way the, the, the main protein happens. So this, you can work with the prosthetic group if you wish, without even knowing what happens to the rest of the protein. So this is also a strength we have. Now, if you want to go a bit further, you cannot do with proton alone, and you will have the person to label the protein with nitrogen. And to do that, the only thing you have to do is to grow your cell, either bacteria, yeast, or whatever, in a uh, medium with nitrogen 15 ammonium chloride. And they incorporate nitrogen in your And label is thick for a main medium chloride we use uh, one gram of ammonium chloride per liter and it costs about uh, 34 euros per liter. So it's not a uh, you can get two people hundred from that. Uh, this, the probe is homogeneous and distributed, okay? You have one NH per residue at least, which is the back of the So uh, it's cheap, it's fast to acquire, and you have a nice distributed probe, so this is the good You get uh, a signal for each residue, for each H and M of the back one, and you also get signal for side chains of endotryptophan and uh, amine, and uh, glutamine. Uh, but, spectrum is very informative. You will see immediately if your protein is structured or structured. If you see all the residues you want to see, you can back, say, you can press the protein, you can just see if you want to see it. If you have 200, that means your protein is going to be in the conformation of the seed. If you have 50, 50, you are not seeing much of the protein, and that means that the, the protein is growing as a conformation in an agricultural system. Now, how, we, how do we know which group? Here I tell you this is Fiorins 56, this is license 51. How did I get there? We call this a sign. And the problem is not trivial because you have to assign the 
quantity of the release your protein. You have, for instance, a small protein, 11 kilodalton, CFTNP, 784 protons, 590 carbons, and 150 nitrogen. Quite a lot of information, but you have to get at times. And for assignment, we start, we use this spectrum as the base, right? Because these NH groups are connected to the rest of the, the of the residue, of the nuclei of the residue. Right? And uh, what we do is to see what are the resonances. Say. You, you step on this signal and you see what are the resonances of the carbons, protons, and sized carbon that are attached to this particular thing. And you can go through the backbone alone by measuring the frequencies of alpha carbon, uh, carbonic carbons and beta carbon. These are the easiest things you to measure. But you can go all the way to the site and get information on all the <coughs> on all the the in the in the site. This is just a, a, a quick example. Uh, the idea is that you get experiments where you find information on the uh, sorry on the resonance of residues preceding DNA and on the resonances of residues of the residues that contain DNA and the preceding one. And if you know who was before and who am I, you can give like a chain and say this is before this one, this is before this one, this is before this one, this is before this one. Eventually you will figure out who is who is the whole uh, this is the, the basic CSV <coughs> assignment. At the end of the assignment process you get a list of chemical sheet for each atom, right? You will have a very long list of where you have the chemical sheet for each atom. Uh, so what we get once we get the yeah, well, what information we have after we get the assignment? We have no kind of formation not in this dimension, but on the structure and, fun and function. Uh, we can evaluate directly the state of the protein in different conditions and specifically. We can localize secondary structure elements, we have dynamics information, uh, we can measure dissociation constant, do interaction mappings and many, many other things. Uh, <coughs> this is something that we hope we will talk about more in detail, I think. But uh, the chemical sheet alone, once you, well, once you get the assignment, you get the chemical sheet, right? And the chemical sheet alone gives information on backbone angle. So, for instance, this, this is a protein which holds a combined to RNA. And uh, what we plot here is the difference between the chemical sheet of the random coil residue and the measured chemical sheet. And you see here the bound protein, you map quite well the predicted the different secondary structure, right? Negative delta delta for delta secretion, positive delta delta for alpha And I want to draw this point D. You can go as far as to calculate the protein factor from chemical sheets alone. And this works quite well for uh, small proteins, so only a time and you can calculate the structure. The reliability is of course not that great, but uh, for many purposes it will be it will, it will be useful and it will be better than just modeling out of the okay. Well I will then just five minutes telling what I, I think you expected to be the main part is how to calculate the structure of, of proteins in the matter. Uh, <coughs> why I don't want to spend much time? Because these are the statistics of PDB in terms of structure in May 2011. 50,000, 50,000 almost in trade, 7,000 at is the tempo difference. So you can see the kind of the technique of choice for solid structure. Uh, in fact, uh, for pro that's the case for protein, you see here the, the pi portion of the NMR versus X-ray. Uh, in this case, you see that, that different, we, are, we are a bit uh, almost half and half, and that I think because it's because nucleic acid, interesting nucleic acid, then not nucleic acid. So, 
the 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 Uh, so what's the structure of information we get from NMR? As I told you, chemical shift, uh, coupling, sum, what is more important, bipolar interaction. The problem we face when we want to solve a structure using NMR is that, well, in the first place, we have to assign the hundred thousand of the problem. I told you it's not that easy, that's that difficult. But we have to assign thousands of interactions between atoms. So every atom will interact with each other. Now we have to assign these interactions, but not only the signals, but the interactions. And this is way more difficult than this. Right? And we have, after that, the complete representation to space all things. This is a very difficult task, and we got another number of times for this, for duty, for solving, for defining the way to solve uh, structural controls using a map. Uh, well, what's the NMR, the NMR data that we use? Chemical sheets, star couplings, protonics in shape, and the star here is the NOEs, the, the, the distance measurement that you get to by interacting with the nuclei that are close to the atom. Right? This is the more important information that we use for calculating the structure. Now, this is what we call a nose spectrum. In this spectrum, you get a peak. For each pair of protons that are close to the neutron. And this is what I was telling you before. We have plenty of interaction between the nuclei, right? So we have one single proton, say, you, you step here at 70 pm. Whatever proton is resonating at 70 pm interacts with a lot of other friends around. So that's the main problem we have here to say each of these spots and who. Who are the, who are the, the, the guys who, that are defining each of these single spots, right? You see here an isolated heavy proton. Even an isolated proton, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven interactions, right? What is proton? The assignment was called one proton and the right one will be seven five right? So, uh, and the main issue here is that there's quite a lot of overlap and you really need to say who is who in terms of interaction. Uh, the only thing that you can use with no problem is an ambiguous peak where you can say, well, this peak corresponds to this high, A, C, 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 and that's usually not the case, that's very difficult. And that's why uh, there are programs who, uh, who do the work for you and they do an interactive work of guessing who's good, calculating the structure, guessing who's good based on the structure, calculating the structure again, and it goes on and on until it converts, and you get the assignments of these interactions and three is right? So, uh, when you go from cycle to cycle, the, the structure goes improving, and here you, you get to have a, a nice bundle of structures, okay? So, the question is, how reliable is an MR? No, no, I mean. <laughs> Otherwise, I would get killed by my colleagues. <laughs> so, uh, and that is a bit embarrassing. And MR stresses are not tracked. They are models. They are models that comply or not, that can, that, that is a, a very large data. So we have a very, very large data set. They are reliable models. They are models. You don't have to forget that. Right? And the reliability depends on how many restrictions you have progressed. So how many different things you tie which are not in the same position. You don't get the single structure, you get the bundle of structure. And uh, one measure of reliability is the RMST, which is the different structure in the bundle. But this informs on precision, not accuracy. So I will tell you that the calculation went all of the time the same way, but you know it went right and it went wrong. Uh, you can also check whether you have violations. Say you expect it to have, uh, I don't know, we think it's a problem, but you expect it to have a away, that's a violation. And that might be, might be because you have wrong assignments, or that may be because the subject 
Uh, you can compare the energy. You can compare the energy between different uh, calculations. Uh, usually, go through known uh, structure comparison by project. And uh, one thing that is also done is to calculate the parameters to see how well they fit the original data. The resolution, if you wish, there's no definition of resolution. But uh, you can see the values that they vary, it varies around the structure. Uh, in secondary structure regions, it's well defined, but loops are more variable. And the core is usually more defined because you have more, more uh, restrictions and less dynamics in the core regions than in the circuit regions. And you can see here, uh, there's an inverse correlation between the RMSD of the bundle and the number of restrictions you have per resin. So this is the number of restrictions you have, and this is RMSD, low restriction, high RMSD, high restriction, low RMSD. Uh, well, so we can calculate structures or models you wish uh, using NOV distances as I hear and in Kashi, and H1 is the same information. Now, I, I can cut the model. I want to talk about this, probably people will be, I, I just figured out that people, by talking with you a bit, you would be more interested in this and other things. Uh, yes, what, this was 1 a.m. yesterday, so uh, I said I want to say a little story. Uh, why this fun to measure interactions through NMI, or using NMI? We have information on molecular interactions with atomic nuclear resolution. You do the measurement in solution, well, biological conditions, you will, and physiological and protein protein concentration, protein concentration, You can follow individual signal for each species, which comes with a complex, three, two, four, and species, whatever you want. You have, you can work on a higher dynamic range, because we can work from very micromolar concentrations to minimal concentrations of less signals uh, in all the in all that range. You can directly detect the bound and refraction. So usually when you do a binding measurement, you want to know how much you have found and how much you have free. You can detect directly how much you have found and how much you have free and information. You get structural quantitative information on this bound and free uh, form, right? And delta omega, uh, saturation transfer, and OE, where I will tell you this. So, what you expect to see when you put things together in a, in a NMR tube is signals, say, you have a ligand, small ligand, a protein, you see the signal from the protein and the signal from the ligand, when they form a complex, they will shift. Okay, the, the, the technical is And that's the first piece of information we get. The other interesting thing about the NMR is that we we can see things in fast distance from other kinds of structures. Because uh, normally, if you have, if you work on a on a distance spectroscopy, an IR spectroscopy, when you get a system with an intro state, you get a structure of the And you will see you have 10 molecules, 10 molecules in the same case, and 5 molecules in the same case. You will see. 10 parts of space and 5 parts of space. In NMR, you can be in uh, situations in which you see the average, or in situations in which you see the temperature, right? And the, the time scale is within uh, relevant ranging for uh, biological problems. Okay? So, uh, the, I, I a bit of a the range of of the time scale is in the order of milliseconds to seconds. And, and many radar processes take place in milliseconds to second time scale. So what will we see when we say have a nitrogen level protein and we are a ligand? We can see two things. Either uh, Ligand in slow exchange or ligand in fast exchange. 
when the ligands is low exchange, so if we are in the low exchange regime where, where we see the two things separated, what we will see is that as we add ligand, the signal from the pre protein will disappear and the signal from bound protein will appear, right? And we can get KDs from the plus of pre versus bound. When we are in part the same regime, we will see that the signal moves from free to bound position. Right? And we can get KDs from free to bound. Okay? This is uh, an actual experiment where we can see several signals that shift upon addition of a ligand and they shift continuous, continuously, that means we are in fast exchange. And uh, the funny thing is that we can map the information of the structure and in this way figure out exactly where the ligand was in the protein, right? And uh, if you get to a modeling guy, uh, he give this information and will give you this kind of quite reliable principle model. Okay? You are not always that lucky. Sometimes you add something to the protein and signals that disappear, but you can get information on this, on this system anyhow. Uh, this is a very funny system we work with. Uh, we have an unfolded protein that falls upon binding. Okay, so you go from this spectrum to this completely different spectrum. So that's in a system. But uh, the thing is that you can calculate, you can get information on the free unfolded form, and you can calculate the structure of the long form. Right? Which you want, this protein won't be like ever. It's an unfolded protein. But we can calculate the structure because we can get information from the bound point of the of the protein, right? You can see the protein on this side, and one funny thing about nucleic acids is that they have signals which are away from the protein envelope, from 10 to 40 ppm, which are the amino proton of RNA, and you can follow the behavior of the RNA in the protein. So you can see on one side of the protein and the RNA of the same experiment, so we are not doing the same experiment, right? It's just acquired run inertial side. You can also see if uh, the system is in exchange or not. If you have trapped protein, it's an exchange of the protein And, well, I will finish by telling you a few things about uh, screening. Uh, Um, I told you that you can get information on right? When you look at it all together, take the information and you will find the right space, the cross the correlation of it between the two points. Now this cross fit can be because of the physics of the of the system, of the system. The cross fit can be positive or negative and that depends on the correlation kind of the So small molecules have positive ionic proton proton ionic, large molecules have negative proton proton ionic. This is small, this is not toxic, this is just So proteins, you get the known system of proteins, it will be negative, you get no system of small molecules, it will be positive. And what happens when you have a small molecule and a big molecule? That's something very interesting. If, you, if the small molecule is exchanged with the big molecule, as the NOE effect is larger or lower sampling rate and negative, if your liga binds the protein in conformation, you can have exchange of information between two protons in the bound form, and this information will be retained in the free form. And you will have data with peaks between these two protons, even if in the free form they are not close together. So you can have information on the bound form seen on the free form. And why is this important? Because uh, as uh, we were talking before, I don't know if I told you this, but we have a slight limitation. Our big thing is right? The lines are just too broad. 
but you can work with any big protein here. You don't need to see the protein. You don't need to see the, the big and powerful protein. But you can see the information, the information transfer that happened here. You will see a signal for the free ligand, and you can actually calculate the conformation of the ligand bound to the protein. It's an example of a uh, nucleotide bound to a galactosyl transferase. You hear the, the, the peaks from the free ligand. If you just the protein, the protein is and you work with excess ligand, and when you mix the, the substrate with the protein, you see the appearance of the Appearance of two things, and it is formed on the conformation of the ligand bound to the top. Right? You don't need to see the protein to see the ligand. The other interesting thing that you can do is what we call a uh, transfer. Imagine that you have the target, pro the protein target, and several possible leads or possible ligands. Uh, What happens is the following. If you, uh, if you evaluate the signal region, what you will do is to equalize the, the population of the signal So you won't have any more signal here. So if you, the population of the signal are the same, uh, you have no signal. Okay? That's saturating the signal. Now this saturation can be transferred to space. So if you have this saturated, you can see here, and can, can fly, can be so, if you have a protein and several ligands, you can saturate the protein and expect that ligands that bind the protein will get the saturation transfer. Right? And this is the kind of experiment you do, and this is the, the answer you get. This is uh, the two below our spectra of two different ligands, and uh, this is the saturation transfer difference. This ligand don't bind to the protein, doesn't bind to the protein, and this ligand does bind to the protein. So you get a saturation transfer, and here again, you don't see the protein, you just see the ligand. If you put a mixture of ligands, you can tell immediately who is binding to the protein, right? because you can identify the ligand from its particular space. You can do this in proteins, it's a bit more complicated because uh, you need to do the rate to, to be able to transfer saturation and that one. Well, I, I guess I will stop here. Uh, there are many more things that you can do, uh, and I will be glad to, to talk with you today. If you want to have any questions, uh, well, thank you for it.